morning. And it's such a pleasant surprise to have uh, the first set of attendees who are already uh, policy makers from India and Cambodia. <coughs> Welcome Jay Shanjanji and Danny Wynn from Cambodia, Jay Shanjanji from India. And we have UNDP colleagues as well joining. Maybe we just wait uh, for a minute more. Uh, and I'm launching a poll so that we understand uh, where is the audience coming from. There you go. So tell us about yourself. Okay, looks good. So 85% of our audience today and, uh, you know, they will keep voting because I keep the poll uh, alive uh, for the next two, uh, two minutes. So 88% 80, of the audience is coming from UNDP and we have 13, I think two uh, of the participants who are uh, policymakers. What I will do is maybe just begin. We are two minutes up. So welcome everyone. Uh, good morning and good afternoon across the region. I don't think we have anyone from beyond uh, uh, beyond our region. So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Afreen Siddiqui from the Regional Innovation Center team uh, and would like to welcome all of you to the third in the series of Next Gen Gov Dialogue. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Uh, and today's uh, theme that uh, we are discussing on is one of the most uh, on demand uh, theme that we have been hearing off late from the government partners as well as our country offices. So we thought why not uh, catch the doers uh, and learn uh, from them. So maybe I can quickly introduce my, uh, uh, my panel. Uh, so we have Sung Ju Son. Uh, he's the director of the Digital Government Cooperation Division, uh, Ministry of Interior and Safety, uh, South Korea. Uh, so he's been in the civil service uh, since 2007. So imagine uh, more than a decade uh, years experience uh, on digital government, service planning, you know, information uh, resources management. Uh, he's been driving the e-government policy and smart government service before joining the digital government cooperation division as uh, senior deputy director. And he recently in February 2020, he assumed as a division director. So uh, we are anticipating we have the right person to be able to ask the right question that we all have been thinking about. Uh, Sungju is joined by Anir, our very own Anir Chaudhary from A to I. So uh, although for, uh, for all the folks in UNDP, we don't, uh, he doesn't need an introduction for us, but quickly to introduce, Anir is a policy advisor for the A to I program uh, with the government of Bangladesh supported by UNDP. And uh, he leads the formation of the whole of society innovation ecosystem in Bangladesh through large scale technology and capacity development, integrated policy formulation, institutional reform and innovation fund. Um, he's also a member of the prime minister's national digital task force and he has co-founded several technology companies uh, in the US and Bangladesh which makes him uh, you know uh, maybe a holistic uh, experienced person to speak on both sectors so even Sungju has uh, worked for the private sector as a researcher before uh, he joined the government so an amazing panel and I'm joined by our communication partners uh, from Gov Insider uh, Joshua uh, he's a He's a good friend at the same time helping us with, uh, uh, with the connect and network along with communications uh, in Gavisider. And we, we are also joined by Sungju Park who's, uh, uh, who supports uh, uh, Sungju Son in Korea. Thank you so much everyone for joining. Since it's a dialogue, I'm not going to talk much. I'm going to leave uh, Anir and Sungju uh, speak to each other. Over to you Anir and Sungju. Thank you. Afrin, thank you very much. Uh... I'm very excited to be here. Sunju, you and I will have a dialogue, conversation about uh, what we're doing in Bangladesh and in South Korea. Uh, so about COVID, how we are tackling COVID. 
and how we're tackling the or planning for the future after COVID, if there is such a thing post COVID. We've been dis debating recently about what post COVID really means, where it starts, when, when does post COVID start? We've been talking about it, we don't know yet. Uh, and thank you, Afrin, for making the introduction. Thank you, Josh, for being with us, maybe helping uh, discuss the present and the future. But also the past is important, right? So what we've been able to do with uh, digital technologies during COVID and how we're planning for the future has a lot to do with our past, how we have planned and executed and uh, set a vision for the future. So let's, before talking about COVID and how we use digital technologies during that time to tackle the pandemic that uh, uh, baffles all of us around the world, let's talk about the past a little bit. Sungju, you've been with uh, the digital government uh, in Korea for about 13 years, as I've been said, and you've seen a lot of uh, transformation during that time. And obviously, uh, the digital transformation of Korea started before you joined the government. So tell us a little bit about how it all started. I mean, was there a time when a decision was made that digital transformation was going to be key for Korea's socioeconomic development? Was there a key decision or what did that happen gradually? Talk about some of the key milestones in the last maybe 20 years of digital transformation of South Korea. Okay, uh, thank you, Anir. And um, I'd like to mention that it has been, it's a, uh, we have a long history. It has been more than 50 years since Korean government started digital transformation, so to say. So yeah, I, I know that in the past, we didn't use the word digital transformation, but there was computerization or implementation. We used that word, but it started in early, uh, early 1760s, I think. And I don't know, I'm sorry about the, not the number. So 1960s, 1970s we started to digitization of the on the basic database spaces from government and every uh, fortunately every regime every government in korea very um, interested in digitization and monetization and they invested uh, their major uh, um, uh, uh, enormous amount of risk uh, resources into digitization. So that was the key of our success. And uh, I think the most important turnaround point was um, early to, in 2000. We uh, decided to build a key project of the digital government. And we uh, almost every uh, services we are currently using was started in that time in early 2000. So that the time the president himself was um, strongly drive the older project, older digital government project, and it, uh, since then we invested a lot of money and a lot of human resources in, into the digital government, and also we uh, built digital society at the same time. The whole uh, high-speed broadband network and also computer was distributed all the. Uh, every population in Korea. So we had good opportunity and also uh, good strong vertical will. And also we built infrastructure as well at the same time. Um, it was enabled by our economic growth, of course, but also it was possible because people, uh, um, grad people gladly followed the lead of government to succeed and they uh, have consented with all the uh, political decisions to build the digital government. That's, that was the key, I think. So uh, it's, it was kind of, kind of too, uh, I think I talked about two, uh, two old stories. So currently we are Having we still are coping with um, all the challenges like a digital divide, and also we have some problem with service coverage and service uh, interoperability problems as well. Also, we are succeeded to uh, succeeded to build some services, but still we have long way to build uh, the more successful 
private and public partnership. So, okay. so you, to tell us a little bit about the, the organizational structure within the government that led oh, this transformation. So how did that come about? Was it one, organiza one organization, a collection of organizations? Was it one individual? Was it a series of leaders? How did that happen? Because often leadership and organizational structure, so leadership makes a difference in terms of triggering something, but also the right organizational structure has to exist to sustain this kind of change. Over a period of, we talked about five decades. I mean, that's, that's a yeah, that's remarkable, right. mm -hmm. remarkable journey. Yeah. First of all, uh, as I said before, the president himself, uh, the many of our president, uh, was really interesting to talk about. That was the key, and uh, they uh, we have built um, ex agencies to uh, give, give the technical consultant and or support for every other ministries, and they helped a lot to through the journey. Uh, through the journey, and they are still exist as a name of. of National agent, or national agency like National Information Agency and um, uh, Internet and Society agencies like that. And also, we had um, bureau, our bureau, my, uh, my bureau, Digital Government Bureau, has played an important role since the journey, uh, through the journey. So we have one ministry and one office to uh, to uh, to be in charge of the our strategy and whole technical standards, but. Also, every other ministries uh, participated in building systems and providing services. And they were kind of, in the first, they were enforced to do that by the president's order and also um, our financial uh, kind of, but uh, we uh, have allocated budget according to the, our strategy, that kind of things. And also we did, we, ha we gave, um, what kind of, what, what can I say? Yeah, um, uh, yes, kind of advantage for the personals who, who do the success part, uh, who succeeded in digital transformation kind of thing. So, um, so maybe um, in other countries, it, it, it could be a little kind of surprising that every ministries, every uh, government agencies follow the, uh, follow the strategy that president, uh, may, president gave and the, our digital government bureau gave. So it was possible because Korea has long history that when uh, one agenda for the nation was decided, um, our people uh, really followed the lead of government. That was our kind of tradition, I think. So, so to build that kind of tradition, it maybe um, I think having a um, dedicated agency will helpful for every other countries. Mm. Dedicated agency, very, very interesting. So let me uh, talk about what happened in Bangladesh. So uh, the computerization process is not new. So as you said, you have a history in, the, in, in South Korea of about 50 years. In Bangladesh, there were ad hoc computerization efforts since the 70s. So, I think we got a supercomputer. There was a lot of scientific computation that happened. We built databases in the 80s and 90s. But the real transformation effort started about uh, 13, 14 years ago. And that came with the political slogan of Digital Bangladesh. Uh, I remember at the end of 2008, uh, uh, the election was going to be held and the political parties in the current, uh, the party that formed the government, uh, announced this uh, very new idea called Digital Bangladesh. So in the election manifesto, uh, there's this new thing that nobody had heard of. Nobody talked about digitization as a way of progress, as a, as a way to leapfrog before 2008. Uh, the A2I program was actually started at the prime minister's office in 2007. And we had developed uh, some vision. We had developed some quick win projects, about 50 of them from the prime minister's office. But the real momentum, the real uh, kickstart actually came with that slogan. And uh, that digital Bangladesh uh, vision that was portrayed for 2021 uh, uh, caught the imagination of the first time voters so much that okay, in the next 13 years, starting from 2008, would become a digital nation. Uh, on that 
50th anniversary of the country's birth, 2021. So we became independent country in 1971. So 2021 is a, is a watershed year for, year for us. And that was the vision that was projected. And a lot of first time voters voted for that, that okay, so they were tech savvy. They wanted to see huge digital transformation. Nothing really was happening. We had phone companies obviously, but in terms of delivering services over the internet or over mobile phones, uh, we really had nothing. Maybe we had about 10 or 12 services at that time. So that's this clarion call of making about 2,800 services, all digital by 2021 was the first giant move. And when the government was, the new government was formed with that vision, uh, we started working on, so we had developed between 2007 and eight, the A2I program had already developed some vision documents for specific sectors like education, health, agriculture, civil service, social safety nets, land. So these are, the, these are the critical areas of our country's development. And we had developed uh, vision documents for each of these, how digital technologies could be applied to leapfrog. So leapfrogging was really the, the key concept at that time. Uh, if I contrast between then and now, in 2008, about 10% of our civil servants had computers. So the computer that I see behind you right now, so they would have a computer in their, in their, on their table, about 10% of them, not 90%. And most of those 10% people would actually keep them covered because they were afraid that computers would get, uh, so you would actually break down a computer if you start using it without really knowing what you're doing. And most people didn't know what they were doing. So there was no email, there was nothing really. So that's where we started. And then some of the leapfrog things that happened, uh, the first, uh, uh, infrastructure development was a bottom-up decision that we uh, made with the Prime Minister uh, 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 in 2009 that we would develop digital centers. So these are access points because most people did not have access to internet and most people, even if they had, they didn't have the digital literacy to operate it. So we were talking about maybe uh, in 2008, less than 1% penetration of internet in the whole country. Now we have 60%. So see the leapfrogging at that time. So we had to set up uh, digital access centers. So people would go there and would pay a small fee to access services from the government. At that time, there were not really many services. As I said, maybe 10 services. So birth registration was just starting out no land records, no passports could be accessed online. Um, so we set up these 4,500 digital centers. Uh, so this, the story of setting that up was also interesting. So we had set uh, about four year timeline that we would go to 4,500 locations. These are all the local government institutions in the rural areas in the country. And we said that we would cover the entire country within four years. So maybe by about 2012 or so. And then in 2010, we found out that uh, UNDP administrator, Helen Clark was coming to Bangladesh. Uh, so we found out this news in 2010, August. And uh, in November of 2010, she was going to visit. So we had three months. So we talked to the prime minister and we said, this could be an interesting global launch of digital centers if we can raise about $40 million, uh, buy the equipment, and train all these people in 4,500 locations. We, we decided that it was going to be a public-private partnership. So it would be hosted in a government office, but no government officers would run this because there was no incentive for the government officers to provide better service. So we thought that we would actually create a business model where we would recruit uh, two entrepreneurs, one man, one woman from the community uh, with the right level of uh, computer or digital education uh, background. And then they would actually run this center and they would sell services. So that's how this was conceived. And we had three months to raise $40 million. We found money within the government, within World Bank. We put in maybe 1% from HY at that time. And it was launched. So Helen Clark came November of 2010. We launched countrywide. We sent Helen Clark uh, to this very remote island in a helicopter. And she was connected to the prime minister who was in the prime minister's office over video conferencing. And uh, so this was how this was launched. So that was a watershed moment, which actually 
put us forward. Uh, and then the rest is history. Now we have about 800 services that are uh, delivered online. We still have another 2,000 to go that we have to still build. A lot of infrastructure investment has happened. Public-private partnership has gone to the roof. Uh, there is intense political will to take this forward. Uh, so, so let me come to you again. Uh, so you talked about infrastructure. You talked about political will. You talked about the organizational setup as well. Now, tell us a little bit about how you created demand. So you said that from the very top, uh, people listen to the government. Uh, but how did you create demand for digital services? Because before services were digital, they were analog. People would go to government offices and would actually apply for things there. And this would require a change of behavior. So you'd have to trust the system that you have applied online and it just goes into some black hole and you would get your uh, document or you would get something back. So how did that behavior change happen in South Korea? Actually, um. Uh, Korean people are very famous for their uh, quick temper. <laughs> I think so. They want things to be quick and bali bali. Maybe somebody heard of the word. Mm -hmm. so, so, so first, we uh, government introduced some kind of digital services like um, civil registration and land registration, car registration, and they uh, the people tasted the uh, this uh, the good part of, of the uh, digital services. They were quick. And they didn't have to wait at the office. They just uh, use the computer and they print out their documents and they just use it. And that was so obvious that these services are more convenient and fast, uh, faster than uh, analog services they, they were experienced before. So people started to uh, demand more and more services to be digital by themselves. So we uh, actually government was surprised because um, we, and we, when you launch one service on digital, digital and that people use uh, almost kind of 80 percent or 70 percent of people use the service instead of the offering service they were used to use. So that's kind of interesting for us. So I think the good services create the demands by itself. So, so this quality of service was the key that created demands in South Korea. Interesting. In Bangladesh, we started uh, calculating the level of inefficiency in service delivery with three parameters called time, cost, and visit. So how much time does it take to get a service? How much does it cost and how many visits you have to make to get a service? And uh, we've seen in the last uh, 10 years of digitization, we have saved our citizens about uh, 2 billion work days, so that's time, $8 billion, so that's uh, cost, and about 1 billion visits have been eliminated. So, so that kind of a change in people's perspective that now they can get it faster, quicker, cheaper. Uh, so that's, that's, that probably has led some of this transformation. One of the things that we have seen in Bangladesh is tying in uh, to electronic services, the concept of digital ID. So one digital ID for every person. So in, in South Korea, how did you handle that? Because it's, it's becoming increasingly important. We have not completely solved the problem in Bangladesh. We have multiple digital IDs now and we're trying to unify them. So mm -hmm. in India, for instance, we have seen Aadhaar has he created a revolution in terms of one ID per person. So what, mm -hmm. what have you done in South Korea? Um, actually, we, we also are still copying with the single digital ID. We didn't have figure, uh, we couldn't have figured out the current, uh, so kind of perfect solution for us at yet. But we had kind of registration number for each people, each person in, in the nine, nine, I think it was 1970s. So we used the number, even the number was created for offline services. We used the number as a key to identify people. So it helped a lot for us to build a system and connect the database between the agencies. But uh, it created some kind of problem for, for personal information protection and also security problems and was a lot of um, kind of technical problems for us. So we are trying to solve the problem by adapting the decentralized ID system and also, and we adapted um, public key uh, infrastructure for, so we uh, use this digital signage for, for identification and, and Still, yet we ha we are trying to figuring out how to create a true digital identity. 
Excellent. So let's talk about COVID. So we've talked about the past, some of the important moments in history between the two countries. So let's talk about COVID. So fast forward to March mm -hmm. of 2020. Uh, what happened and how did you deal with the situation? And how did, uh, what did you use the digital infrastructure and the services for COVID response? Yeah, uh, digital infrastructure helps a lot by providing us transparency and the speed to spread information to our, to our people. So we shared all the information uh, with people and people can respond by themselves according to the information. For example, we provide um, the danger zone, uh, kind of we are, so the dangers of in effect, infection and uh, danger zone for over infection for people and people can abide, avoid that area. And also we provided um, information about the um, important supplies like masks to protect mm -hmm. people um, with the help of the private sector. We provided a lot of information very quickly and uh, very accurately. So it was very helpful for people. Mm. So that was information, but how about let's say healthcare services? Oh. So because of lockdown, people could not go to the clinics and the hospitals or were mm. encouraged not to. So mm. did you have some kind of a telemedicine service oh. or telehealth service or did that, did that boom during this time? Now, um, for that part, we Korea didn't uh, uh, use telemedicine to cope with COVID nineteen. We actually um, used built special uh, special kind of hospital. Or we arranged special hospital and special clinics for the COVID nineteen. But it was an off it's offline, not the online um, and telemedicine system. So it was uh, useful and it was effective. But we. Yeah, we also considering uh, using telemedicine in the future, but in March, in this March, you didn't use telemedicine to cope with COVID-19. I see. But how about other illnesses? So obviously, because COVID-19 restricted movement, mm -hmm. so chronic illnesses, let's say people needed help with diabetes, help with uh, cardiac mm -hmm. yeah, got it. Did they also go to specialized hospitals uh, created for them, or did they get some support using digital means, apps or phone or anything else? So we, we set up the special hospital for COVID-19, especially. So there's clinics only deal, dealing with COVID-19. So, and also there's other hospitals so dealing with other diseases and other um, illnesses. So we separated people who are infected or could be infected, infected from other patients. That was the key. And it was possible because Korea has a lot of hospitals and clinics in, um, in the whole country. So that was the key, I think. That's why we didn't need a telemedicine at the time. Okay, okay, great. In the context of Bangladesh, uh, some interesting things happened. So first, in March and April, we saw that we only had one testing center for, for COVID-19. Uh, and we, we, the, the disease was spreading. We didn't know where it was spreading. So we had to set up a hotline where people were calling in to report symptoms. Oh, mm. And this hotline allowed us to uh, track disease progression. So we would actually so we'd set up this thing mm. called syndrome surveillance. So they would call. They would uh, uh, basically use apps or internet. Oh. Uh, most yeah. people would call because they didn't have access to internet at that time. Uh, and we, since uh, we set this up in April, since April, so the last uh, three and a half months, we have had about 10 million people calling in. And this allowed us to predict where the disease was growing the fastest. At least uh, 10 days ahead of real testing began. Testing was ramped up. So by June, we now have about 70 centers doing testing and then uh, still not adequate, no, but we can do about 20,000 tests a day as opposed to maybe a few hundred a day in April. But this uh, phone line actually helped us track disease. Mm -hmm. At the same time, this phone line became the telemedicine service. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people call in and said, okay, I'm reporting symptom using IVR, using USSD. But I also want to talk to a doctor sometimes. And then we basically created this Uber pool of doctors, about 4,000 doctors signed up, mm -hmm. volunteers. And uh, people calling in with symptoms could also talk to a doctor and get prescription. 
Sometimes these would be non-COVID prescriptions, of course, because they called in with other 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 illnesses mm -hmm. as well. So almost within a few weeks, we created the largest telemedicine service within the government, with the so with about 25 telemedicine companies. So this was created with, within within a few weeks. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, social safety net. Uh, so if, I mean, just before the program, we were just discussing. So you needed to pay a lot of people, right? Uh, the entire entire population. I think you had a you, you had marked a large part of the population who needed needed to be paid. So how was that done, and who did you decide would come under this program? Who would you pay? Did you pay everybody? So universal basic income kind of a thing, or did you target specific needy parts of the population? Actually, I, I, I think I need to talk a little bit about our telemedicine before I answer your question. Yeah? So, um, actually, we also had the self-diagnosis apps and also we have a call center, especially on help with an AI. We had automated call center for the medical assistant, the medical advice for people who has kind of possible symptom related to COVID-19. I, what I mentioned was the actual treatment and actual test. When also we actually we also used um, apps and also internet services to get the people from uh, from there uh, can provide people about their symptoms and advices and, and know about the symptoms. That's what I wanted to say. And about your question, um, we distributed subsidies to all people in con in the country because. Um, COVID-19 has impacted a lot on our economy, whole economy, not only the people who infected. So mm -hmm. we, our government decided to distribute subsidies to all, all people, to all the popular population. And it was a huge, huge, because um, we have more than 50 million people in Korea and we have to distribute in a, in a short time because of people are suffering from um, from every problem, uh, every kind of problem, like they can, can can find a job and they can they don't have customers for small businesses. So we decided to distribute the whole distribute the whole portion of money in one month. We succeeded to do that by cooperating with banks and credit card companies. We use their infrastructure and their system to get the application and distribute distribute the money. And we, there was, that was huge success. And uh, it was actually, we are all surprised by the uh, outcome of the, our strategy. So we, that was the key uh, of our success that part, private and public partnership. And that was the turnaround that we are considering that we need more private and partnership to build and provide the services. So yeah, that's what I mean. Sure. In the, in, the, in the context of Bangladesh, I'm just looking back in the last few months. So a lot of the daily wage earners became jobless. So rickshaw pullers, street hawkers, vegetable sellers, construction workers, they became jobless. So we estimated about uh, 5 million new needy households would have to be supported with cash. And another 5 million households would have to be supported with food. And then we didn't know who these people were. We, we didn't have the resources to support everybody in the country. So we could not send food support or, uh, or money support to everybody. So we needed to pick. And this is again where we use digital technologies, created new databases uh, for these people. There was a lot of movement during that time. People from the cities were actually, did, did, despite the lockdown, we had people moving back to their village homes where they just could not stay in the cities. Uh, but we had to find them using digital technology, using their mobile phone, uh, numbers, we actually tracked them down, developed the databases. Again, this took us about a month or so. But we, again, just, just like you, we use the private sector infrastructure for mobile payments. So we use mobile payments, we use banking. So we, we brought in the mobile uh, financial service providers, all of them. We brought in the banks and that's how uh, electronic payments were done. So we made a very strong decision that no cash payment would be done in the form of cash. It would actually always go through electronic payments. And during this time, again, another leapfrog happened. Uh, we enrolled millions of new people in our uh, digital databases for payments that, that did not exist. So again, national ID was used. So we tied all payments to, to IDs. And things that would have taken years to do took us weeks during the COVID period because that was 
a crisis, everybody worked together within government and with the private sector. So unprecedented collaboration. Uh, uh, the last thing that I wanted to ask is around education. So schools and colleges, universities were shut down in, in Bangladesh and, and also in South Korea. I think you've, you've started opening them up recently, right? Your schools yes. and colleges have started opening up. We have not opened them yet. We may do them uh, in, in September, starting in September, we're still thinking about it. So how did you conduct education during this time? So millions of school kids, university students, not going to physical institutions. So was it all online or was it, what, what did you do? What, what do you think the impact of this will be in the future? Yeah, in the early stage of, of outbreak, we, our uh, schools are also closed and ye, we have used um, online measure to provide education. So, unfortunately, we had um, nationwide, um, nationwide online education system, which was not sufficient for all the people, but governments um, rapidly decided to expand the infrastructure and we invested uh, a lot of resources and cooperate with private uh, data centers and other infrastructures to uh, expand the capacity of the system. So we launched uh, launched the uh, e-learning platform for the older students from the elementary school to high school. And in the first time, there was some kind of problems like um, delay and also some kind of no connection problem, but now it has stabilized and every student in Korea using the system, even though we often the school, school on partly, but we, are, we couldn't open the school for the whole time as well so we um, maybe um, I think half of the students are going to school and half of students are staying in, staying in the home in the, uh, for the university students uh, they have their own solutions to provide that uh, e-learning or other kind of education so I think some online education has been a major part of the, our education because the COVID-19 was a huge change great in Bangladesh, there was not a whole lot of online education. We had some ad hoc uh, platforms, but by and large, it was all physical. So we, we uh, suffered a huge setback during this time. So 45 million uh, uh, students in primary through tertiary, including vocational, madrasa education, uh, were at home. So what we did early, early on is to move a large part of the education over TV. So we started broadcasting uh, educational programs in the parliament TV that we have. So parliament TV is only used for parliament broadcasts. And obviously there was no parliament session during this time. So we repurposed that to make this into an education TV. So that has been somewhat successful. We've been able to estimate it uh, about 60% uh, of our 55 to 60% of our uh, students uh, using TV. Uh, we also use the internet, maybe about 30% of the students we were able to reach uh, using internet. But that basically means we have a huge number that are not reached. And that's what we are worried about now going forward. Uh, uh, so we covered a whole gamut of things during COVID, how we have used digital infrastructure, political will, uh, uh, public-private partnership, national ID to address uh, uh, health, address social safety net, address education, address a whole bunch of other things. So I see that there are a lot of questions coming in through both the chat and the Q&A section. So I'll, I'll stop with our dialogue, Sungju and myself, and hand over to Afreen so that we can address some of these very, very relevant and important questions that are coming through over chat and Q&A. Afreen, over to you. Thank you so much, Anir. Uh, thanks a lot, Sungju. It was, uh, so we went into that world where we are literally flying between uh, Korea and Bangladesh uh, to look at, uh, how to that have a drone view of uh, of, uh, you know, both the country's digital transformation. And as we speak, I'm also happy to share that uh, our, our country office in Sri Lanka is actually doing a digital transformation workshop with the president's office uh, uh, in Sri Lanka. So things are moving fast uh, within and outside UNDP. So, uh, you know, the, the topic itself is in demand. So I would let the first question in from Jayesh Ranjanji, who is a, a senior bureaucrat, uh, from the government of India. Jai Shanjanji, I have unmuted you. Over to you for your question. 
Thank you, Afrin. You have uh, unmuted me, of course, but you have not made me visible. But uh, nevertheless, I'm uh, delighted to uh, interact with uh, Mr. Chaudhary and uh, Professor Son. Uh, this is very fascinating and very educative. Uh, my question is, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Afrin. So uh, <clears throat> my question is to uh, Mr. Chaudhary. So uh, I do understand that uh, both in Bangladesh and in Korea, tremendous steps have been taken to create a very robust uh, digital infrastructure. But my question is about uh, what are we doing to bridge the digital divide? Because we know that there are uh, older generation learners, there are uh, people who could not get into mainstream education because of a variety of reasons in India as well as in Bangladesh. And uh, in India, one of the biggest uh, challenges, a struggle, so to say, has been to how to get the buy-in of people whenever we are introducing, let us say, a health solution using digital or an education solution using digital. The kind of uh, intuitive buy-in we anticipate does not happen because still that huge digital divide is there. So I would like to know specifically, is there any thought or any plan or have you rolled out any program which has yielded good results in Bangladesh? And obviously uh, in Korea, I presume that the divide is much less now, but in those days, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, was something done specifically to bridge the digital divide and get the buy-in of uh, all the people? Great, thank you Great. so thank much. You uh, so much. Can you hear me? There seems to be. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me. So you have two two things that you asked: digital divide and uh, maybe demand creation. Maybe they're linked. Uh, so in the case of Bangladesh, uh, one of the ways that we try to address digital divide is to create these digital centers uh, across the country that I talked about. So you would actually go as an as an elderly uh, who would get a pension as a widow who would get a widow allowance, you would go to one of these centers and we would get your service done. You, you could apply for a land record, you could apply for any other service. So about 150 or so services, uh, right now about 200 I think, services are actually delivered from this. And since it actually works as a public-private partnership, there is incentive for the private sector operator running these centers to excel and be as citizen-centric as possible because otherwise, uh, they would go somewhere else. And now we're actually expanding that into private sector, creating another 25,000 centers. So that's one way we are addressing digital divide. The, 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 in a way, the Western thinking of digital divide that we would make things accessible uh, using devices, we did not look at it that way. We, we, we made sure that we would make it accessible by creating intermediaries, new forms of intermediaries who would intermediate the divide. And that has worked to some extent in Bangladesh. And these centers have become uh, bank branches. These centers have become e-commerce centers. So they have brought in, because they're very entrepreneurial, these uh, uh, now 5,000 centers, soon to be about 25 or so thousand. They brought in all the post offices recently, another 8,000 or so. So they're starting to do that. So that's one way. Uh, another way to do uh, address digital divide is to make government very citizen centric. So we use this uh, uh, training called empathy training over a period of uh, four years and tens of thousands of bureaucrats actually have gone through empathy training. And that showed them how to think through the, through the lens of the, of the marginalized citizens, the poor, the elderly, the widow, the persons with disabilities, so that they can redesign their services to make them available in a digital way from these digital centers. Uh, and as internet penetration is rising, as uh, we are seeing a new generation of people becoming more and more adept in accessing services directly. It's also happening. Recently, we've also taken a mobile first strategy so that uh, people who have access to mobile phones and about 95% of people that have access to mobile phones can ac access services over, over, the, over the phone. Now, only 35% have access to smartphones. So when we say mobile first strategy, we are bringing in IVR, we are bringing in call centers, and that's part of the digital divide addressing. So it's design thinking, it's uh, accessing old and new technologies and not making, making everything uh, smartphone friendly only. Thank you. 
Um, actually, I also would like to mention that Korea also has a similar policy with the Internet Access Center in Bangladesh. So we also had information village, which uh, is uh, uh, which helps people elderly, elderly or um, who people like the elderly who has no digital literacy to use the services by uh, dispatching uh, experts at, in the office or at training the young people or who has digital literacy to help them. So it was very successful in Korea as well in the, in the past. And also we are trying to design the services to, uh, services to, for people uh, who doesn't doesn't have who don't have study literacy uh, by using emerging technologies like AI. So so to speak, um, by let uh, by using the natural language, they can use the older services like they can chat with the chatbot to use the government services, and they can also use um, the voice assistants like Alexa or. Cortana to, to access the government services. That helps people a lot because they don't have to run the computer. They just uh, need they just need to know how to dial and how to speak to uh, to uh, communicate with the government. That will be the key of the, our solution of digital divide. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Anir and uh, Sungju. Uh, JSG, I hope uh, they managed to answer your question. Yes, of course. Uh, very useful to learn about how these uh, assisted ways of uh, helping uh, through these uh, kiosks or centers have been tried out in both uh, Bangladesh and Korea. Also, uh, very useful to learn about uh, Professor Son's uh, explanation on how voice-assisted solutions have been found using chatbot, etc. So, definitely ideas which are very uh, important and very impressive and definitely worth uh, replicating in my country as well. So we know for sure that you're doing all the amazing innovative stuff in India. So this will add to uh, add to those uh, great things uh, that you're doing. So maybe the next question um, is, uh, sorry, Yaku, I'm just going to tell something. So he's, uh, so I will pat my back uh, by saying that the, the busiest person in the Bangkok Regional Hub has joined our webinar, which means it's an achievement. Sungju and Anir, we are just joined by uh, Yako, who's the manager at the Bangkok uh, Regional Hub. Yako, uh, you had a question for Sungju? Yeah, maybe just both uh, to Sungju and Anir. First of all, just to say thank you very much, colleagues, also for the sharing. I think, uh, you know, what, what we learn also in our work is that these uh, richness of sharing and learning from each other, doesn't matter where you are and what type of context you're working in is always helpful and we always get new insights. So uh, same for me, I learned a lot today and thank you also for the incredible work that you're already doing in that area. Uh, maybe my question is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one is, uh, you know, this is also part of our next gen gov uh, series, correct? So we're looking at what are the next wave of challenges that governments would face. And I think uh, we, we've now, in many ways, and I think the two examples you have in Bangladesh and Korea has really shown that digital services and services to citizens really need to be digitized and can, can make such a difference in the lives of people and also what, uh, how governments respond to their needs. But, but where do you envision is the next, next, you know, the next phase, the next uh, challenge uh, that we will face around digitization? I think you've mentioned a number of areas that you're already trying to overcome. But what are those that, that really big next challenge uh, that we have to address, whether it's through the digital means or services or through others? And then the second one for me is something that we, we didn't touch on in the discussion much is, is we also hear that as we're becoming uh, better uh, globally uh, around digital services, the issue of privacy, of rights of citizens uh, constantly comes up. Um, and so maybe just insights of how are you dealing with that and how do you ensure that that balance is also kept where, you know, the more we become a global community or, or part of the national digital uh, services, uh, we also have the privacy and human rights areas that constantly citizens care about. Uh, so just how that is handled within the, the provision and services that you provide. So maybe both to, all, to both, the, to both uh, Song Jun and to Anir. Thank you very much. Sam, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, yes, I will go first. So, actually, your two questions related because um, I think the most uh, the most important challenge we are facing with is the privacy and the 
uh, personal information protection problem, I think. So in Korea, we enacted a um, dedicated law for personal information protection in 2011. Since then, we are really concerned with the privacy and the information protection and also security to protect people being harmed by these services kind of, and also there could be a lot of um, setbacks or disadvantages uh, because of the um, fast spreading information and also privacy invasion kind of thing. So we are trying to build uh, build technical technical guidelines and also political guidelines to use the data safely and securely. And also we are trying to communicate with um, civil society to have a consensus about the privacy and this service provisioning and the um, digital economy. Because data is the key and da data sharing is the very important in digital economy, but also it also includes, it increases the danger of you know, privacy invasion in the course of the um, expansion of services. So it will be our biggest challenge in next few decades, I think. And also we are trying to cope with the challenge by using technology, te technological method and political method and also uh, with co communicating with civil society as well. Yeah. That's my answer for, for the question. And Anir, your turn maybe. Yes, thank you. Uh, so again, uh, going by what uh, Sungju said, similar. Uh, so two new frontiers that we're trying to deal with. One is the ID, another is data tied to ID. We have seen this in during the COVID period. So when we set up the syndromic surveillance uh, call uh, call center hotline, uh, so that had an artificial intelligence part to it. A lot of data was coming in. This is confidential data coming in through all the telcos, and we had to deal with it in a very sensitive way. We had to set up a new infrastructure within our Ministry of Home, uh, supported by a very uh, uh, specialized agency within the government that deals with uh, this kind of sensitive data. So we had to bring them in. We could not do it ourselves. A uh, lot of intelligence data was handled by this agency. So they came in to help. So that collaboration was set up within a week. Uh, but still, we were dealing with sensitive call data, sensitive health data. and subsequently sensitive travel data also, because now uh, people, when they're leaving the country, they need a COVID negative certificate. So, so we saw the, this juxtaposition, this nexus of ID, nexus of different types of data, much of it is big data, unstructured, and uh, we're trying to make sense of it. But having said that, I'll also cite from a, from a conference that I attended in Bangalore just a couple of years ago. There was a, so this, the conference was on financial inclusion. And uh, we saw two reports, one from primarily uh, Western countries, so North America and Europe, and another from Southern countries. And one of the few things that came up was what is the most important uh, thing people actually think about when they look at digital services? Uh, in the Western report, privacy was number one. In the Southern report, it was not privacy. It was actually quality of service. So. At this point, people actually can compromise privacy to get improved services. But that may not be the case in future. In, in future, when everybody sort of becomes habituated with quality of digital services, then they'll start thinking more about privacy, which is already happening in many countries. So we have to think of quality of services with privacy uh, protected. And when we talk about informed consent, I mean, that's a complicated matter, but we're trying to figure that out in the context of a largely digitally illiterate and also largely uh, generally illiterate or semi-literate population. What does informed consent really mean? So those, those are things that we are grappling with right now. Thanks a lot, Thank you, uh, Amir. Yeah, thanks. Yes, Yako. Thanks a lot for, uh, uh, for your responses. So maybe, uh, you know, Shweta is asking two questions. It's in the Q&A section. One is the curiosity to know about uh, 
uh, about the contact tracing app and the, how did you manage to maintain the, uh, the privacy of the citizens with the data? Uh, and in continuation to that, uh, there's another question that she asked about the digital adoption index, um, uh, Korea being one of the top 10 countries uh, globally. So maybe Sungju, if you can reflect, and then it's also followed by another question from our colleague in Bhutan. So maybe I'll let you answer this first. About the contact tracing, um, we had laws about the contact tracing. So that's why people uh, can, uh, uh, pe people can be um, can be consent with the government policy that we are opening the uh, opening the mo uh, con movement of the infected people. We are not opening the personal information for uh, FYI. Um, we are just opening the the where uh, opening the places that or where they where the infected people went, and we trying to avoid the um, privacy invasion by um, following the rules and the laws we have. Uh, our parliament has passed uh, with the consent of all the people. So uh, it's kind of delicate and in, delicate and difficult um, challenge to um, to share to do the contact tracing without the privacy invasion. I know, but. Um, it was possible because uh, we have social consensus, uh, social consensus in our society, and also it was possible because we ha had uh, our people had a belief in the, in the government that we are tr trying our best to protect the people's um, privacy. That's why. And about the um, digital uh, adoption, um, it's kind of interesting that in Korea. Um, government didn't ha actually didn't have any um, s specialized policy to improve adoption of digital solutions like digital payments, because um, as I said before, the uh, convenience of the services itself, the service themselves, um, proved them valuable, and people try people wanted to use the services, and um, in the market. The, the market operates operates in the way that they they should be. So providers providers needed uh, providers needed to adapt the digital solutions to um, sell the services uh, more, more to people and people wanted more of the digital services to be, uh, to use them in more convenient way. So I think it. it this is not so helpful answer, but building um, qualified and useful services can lead to the um, natural adoption of digital services. That's what Korean did. Thanks so much, Sungju. So maybe the last question uh, that we have from Bhutan, and then we uh, we move towards wrapping this up. Uh, Sharing asks about the sustainability. So yeah, this was my question as well. Uh, you know, there are a lot of these information centers that you generally open, speci especially when it comes to rural parts uh, of any country. How do you ensure sustainability? So while establishing, it's great to establish, and uh, you know, in the beginning, it's great. But how do you maintain, uh, uh, maintain, and uh, you know, make it su sustainable? Maybe I can ask this to both of you, Sungju, if you can go first, and then Anir. Actually, uh, we are all suffering from the sustainability problem of our, as I said, information village. Um, we are trying to make a um, new business model for information village. Like uh, we are providing services of, of kind of internet shopping for the village. So people uh, in the village can sell their, um, their special products um, on, this, on, on the dedicated shopping mall for information village. and. They can use the money uh, from the from the shopping mall to uh, to support the operation of the information village itself, and also we are trying to um, use use the um, com community volunteers to help the operation of the information village as well. So, but still, we are still coping with the sustainability problem, and so we are trying to find a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Anir, over to you. 
the business model. So uh, I, I talked about how we started with the business model for the digital centers, which are these information centers. They started with information, but then started selling services. And people pay a small fee because they don't have to go to a long distance uh, uh, trip multiple times. So people are willing to pay that fee. So what we have seen out of these 5,000 or so uh, digital centers that we've set up across the country, about 70% are fully financially viable right now. Uh, the 30% are actually struggling in many forms. Some are actually uh, situated in very hard to reach areas where the poverty uh, situation is quite dire. And that's where people don't have the capacity to pay for these services. So that's why we have to take affirmative action. We have to provide subsidies. But there is also, uh, we're, we're bringing in business services. So as I said, a lot of banks actually have made these centers. About 4,000 of these 5,000 centers are bank branches now. So banks provide their own training. Banks provide their own support because they make money of these centers. A lot of e-commerce companies have come in recently. About uh, 2,000 of these centers have become e-commerce centers where people can actually come and sell products and these centers now facilitate logistics and digital payments. People, so this is another way to bridge that digital divide that we talked about earlier. So it's just the only way to do sustainability is to come up with the right business model. The government should not and cannot provide long-term subsidy to these uh, digital uh, modes of service delivery. I think it has to be done through some kind of a business model. Thank you so much. Sustainability is equal to business, the new normal post COVID-19 uh, for the governments to adopt. Thanks a lot, uh, Sungju and Anir for joining us. And I hope colleagues, you enjoyed, uh, you know, this uh, learning session where uh, both of them were actually sharing notes with each other. So if you are interested to learn more, uh, be a part of uh, uh, digital transformation within the, uh, the Bangkok Regional Hub, we at uh, the Regional Innovation Center are working very closely uh, with the country offices. So please reach out to us with your demands, your ideas. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I say a goodbye and have a good uh, weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Afrin, for organizing this, and to Joshua also, and Songju, my co-panelist. Thank you, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.